Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct privilege to welcome you to the fifth iteration of the Arctic Distinguished Speaker Series. The Distinguished Speaker Series invites professional commentators, academics, and professionals to present on a range of topics that stimulate professional discussion about the future of armed conflict. Through the knowledge and experience of some of the best thinkers, educators, and practitioners of history, technology, and warfare, we are afforded the unique opportunity to broaden our critical thinking and problem-solving skills. Today's guest speaker will certainly encourage critical thinking and problem-solving with his presentation on the challenges of the now and the implications for America's land forces in the future. Dr. D David Johnson is a senior historian at the RAND Corporation. His work focuses on military innovation, joint operations, and strategy. He is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University where he teaches a course on strategy and military operations. From June 2012 until July 2014, he was on loan to the U.S. Army from RAND to establish and serve as the first director for the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Strategic Studies Group. Dr. Johnson is the author or co-author of numerous articles, books, and reports. Noteworthy among these are Fast Tanks and Heavy Bombers, Innovation in the U.S. Army from 1917 to 1945, Learning Large Lessons, The Evolving Roles of Ground Power and Air Power in the Post-Cold War Era, and Hard Fighting, Israel in Lebanon and Gaza. His complete biography can be found in your program. Ladies and gentlemen, before inviting Dr. Johnson to the microphone, I would like to introduce the host of the Arctic Distinguished Speaker Series, the director of the Army Capabilities Integration Center, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, to provide a few comments about today's presentation. Thanks, Kelly. Hey, it's great to see everybody. Welcome. Thanks, everybody, so much for coming. I want to welcome Dr. Johnson, obviously, and, and, uh, and I also want to, want to, uh, want to, to uh, Welcome Tim Bonds, who is here as the director of the Royal Center at RAND. You know, RAND has done just some tremendous work lately, and always have done great work, but in particular, they've done great work that exposed really some significant risks to our national security, risks associated with lack of capacity or size in ready land forces that are capable of, uh, of operating for sufficient scale and for ample duration uh, to, to accomplish our missions. But then also recognizing the dangers that we see from emerging threats. And, and I think just even a cursory view of the headlines shows you how important of a lecture it is today uh, with, with, uh, with Dr. Johnson. You know, it's, it's clear that our Army has to face a range of enemies and to, to pr protect our national security by either preventing conflict or responding to crises, defeating our enemies. Uh, you know, if you look at the conflicts that are going on in the world today, the one thing they have in common is that they're about the control of territory and populations. And our Army, as part of the Joint Force, plays a foundational role in, 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 uh, in being able to, to, uh, to cope with those threats, defeat those enemy organizations, and, and reestablish control uh, of, of territory and, 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 uh, and, and uh, populations. If you just look around the world, you see the range of actors that we, that we have to face. There is a terrorist pseudo-state that is now established in the greater Middle East. Uh, it has, created, has already created a humanitarian catastrophe of colossal scale, that along with the continuing Syrian civil war, Regional dynamics in the greater Middle East are, are, are trending toward a continued sectarian civil war uh, between Sunni and Shia, fueled in large measure by Iran and their clandestine and covert operations uh, in the region. You have that overflowing now into, into ethnic tension uh, between the, the Turks uh, and the Kurds, uh, a tension that I think could, could then reignite a, a very destructive uh, terrorist and insurgent campaign that, uh, that, that existed there until the 1990s. That in turn is, is shifting regional dynamics with, with Turkey going against the Assad regime and with what's happening uh, with the Iranians in the region uh, toward tension between Turkey and Iran. Turkey has been taking some action lately that, that gets them closer to the Russians. The Russians have been cultivating relationships among our allies like the Turks, but among others, uh, you know, our, like, like the Pakistanis recently, and we think we see you know, a shift in dynamic as China and Russia come together a threat to really stability in South Asia and Central Asia as well. Uh, what's going on in Eastern Ukraine has been an eye-opener, I think, for us in terms of disruptive technologies and, and how unconventional forces operating in the cover of conventional forces can change the geopolitical landscape in, in Europe and, 
and we're faced with not only Russia, but also China, who are doing everything they can to combine economic action and military action to destroy the post-World War II security and economic order in the world. Uh, all that and, you know, North Korea, you know, which I think is very difficult to overstate the threat from North Korea, which we know just fired rockets into the south yesterday. So, so anyway, job security for us, right? Look on the bright side. The, but, the, but, the, uh, but, but what this really requires of us, even as our army gets smaller, is that we have to really think clearly about the threats to national security, think clearly about the threats that our army forces as part of the joint force will face today and in the future, and do everything we can in our, in our job, in our mission here at ARCIC and in TRADOC to ensure that our forces are prepared to fight, win, and accomplish the mission in, in future war. There's nobody better to do that than Dr. Johnson. I, I encourage you to read all of his publications. His book, Fast Tanks and Heavy Bombers, is a model about how to think clearly about, about doctrinal change and concepts as a foundation for future force development, where that can go off track. Uh, and, and, uh, and his most recent scholarship, I think, highlights emerging challenges in land combat from southern Lebanon in 2006 to more, the more recent actions in Gaza to the Sutter City fight. So please join me in a round of applause for Dave. Well, thanks, HR. I mean, it's a real privilege to be in front of the folks that I've in many, you know, worked with for many years and have helped me think more clearly about the things I do. But I'm always reminded when I come to one of these things about George Bernard Shaw when he's introducing a distinguished lecturer. And he has him backstage and says, are you ready to go on? He says, yes, I am. He says, how much time do I have? And he says, well, 15 minutes. Says, well, how can I possibly say everything I know in 15 minutes? He says, speak very slowly. <laughs> Um, so I got like over an hour so I can speak at a regular pace, I hope, but the, I want to leave time for your questions. What I want to do today is share thoughts on what I believe the future holds in store for the Army and the Joint Force, not in 25, 2025, but tomorrow morning. In short, the future is now, and we know a great deal about our future adversaries and the operating environments we're going to be in. If you look around the world, HR, you pretty much encapsulated it. So we shouldn't be confused about the problems that are out there or what we need to do about them. Now, this work is based on you know, stuff I've done over the last 30 years, but mostly you know, focus on Israel's challenges in Lebanon and Gaza, uh, what we faced in Sadr City, and quite frankly, also I just finished a, an article for Parameters a couple a month ago on ISIS and how the solutions we're posing are many of the same fallacies we've talked about for years and the only people that can solve this problem are competent U.S. ground forces. I think the challenges you know, can be pretty much characterized on these charts. Um, competent adversaries, particularly in the middle and high ends of the range of operations, using good weapons and developing better ones in the case of state adversaries. And they're showing these pictures. The top one is a Syrian uh, rebel firing a cornet and a tank guided missile. Uh, it will defeat any armor in the world. There is no ERA that will stop a cornet with a dual-shaped warhead. Uh, the second is a grad rocket firing uh, in the Ukraine uh, with Russian separatists. Uh, I'll show you some more on that later. And finally, whether you think the T-14 Armada tank is you know, any good or not, someone in the world is developing new armor, and it's not us. I also want to be provocative um, and shake things up a little bit uh, and be really candid with you about some of it and with your questions, because I think you know, time is not on our side. Uh, this is not something that the acquisition process is going to be nimble about and solve in the morning. Uh, and I'll show you some of the challenges, because I think you know, we are not ready for the full range of operations at this point. Next slide. So I believe there's three distinct categories of adversaries that we're going to have to be prepared to fight. Uh, I also believe that we've missed much of what's been going on in the last you know, 12 years because we've been riveted on a different problem, which is understandable. But we're not ready for hybrid and state actors. Uh, this period, you know, when I was thinking about it the other day, particularly since I was coming down here. Um, we are having a chat before lunch. Arctic and TRADOC are the architects of the future, you all know that, but it's the only place in the Army where you're expected to have ideas. 
that you have the institutional capacity to have ideas and shape what the Army's thinking about in the future. And the last time we really did this successfully was, you know, here, down the road actually, in a much nicer location, I thought. I like the buildings better. But the, uh, it was in 1973, at the end of the Vietnam War, when we all of a sudden saw what had happened while we were busy somewhere else uh, with the development of you know, new technologies and new operational concepts. Uh, Arctic, or not Arctic at the time, but TRADOC at the time, or General Depew, this is where the ideas for how to fight outnumbered and win came from, where airland battle came from, where the Big Five came from. The Big Five just didn't sprout out of the ground one day. The Big Five were based on technologies required to engage in combat in the land domain with new concepts, airland battle principally. Next slide. So, although our attention has been rightly riveted on these folks uh, since 9-11, the non-state irregulars, their characteristics are here. You all know these folks. Um, they are limited to small arms generally, RPGs, the occasional mortar, occasional rocket, or man pad. But the man pad and rocket firing are events. They're not capabilities. Um, so they're not something to be particularly concerned about. They also operate in small formations unless they can accidentally get a position of advantage because they know we have overhead ISR and strike that will fundamentally take them out. These are adversaries like the Taliban, AQI, and the Mujahideen in the early days in Afghanistan, the Soviet fight. And these are enemies that you fix in the close fight and use direct or indirect fires to destroy. So it is a contact, close fight engagement in most cases. And I think what's really important here is that, and I tell this to the places I give this lecture, rarely has a platoon been at risk. There have been three occasions I could find where, you know, Objective Peach with Rock Marcone, where a battalion was not at risk but had a really hard fight. But OP, one Ott, and Keating are the only times we've had platoon-sized formations that could have been defeated. Uh, and most of those two things were a result of bad tactical decisions, not the adversary. So we, like the Israelis before the 2006 Lebanon War, have become expert in fighting this kind of adversary. Next slide. And the weapons and other capabilities we designed and produced were focused on the fights we were in, which is expected. These were monumental efforts, Manhattan projects, if you will. A new, you know, extremely effective, expensive project to defeat the IED threat, which is most you know, characterized by the creation of Task Force Odin and Jaido. And we also fielded thousands of MRAPs, upper and arm, up armored or Humvees, adapted the Striker, the Bradley, and the M1 to survive and, and win in these environments. We even deployed, you know, which I would never have believed if I hadn't seen a picture of it, the Sea Ramp to take on the indirect fire threat because the indirect fire threat was small enough that it could be handled by numbers of these systems. Finally made huge leaps in providing brigade combat team commanders with capabilities that division and corps commanders couldn't have imagined in 9-11. In uh, and we started employing them in Iraq in 2003. In the 2008 Battle of Sadr City, the highly effective integrated air ground ISR system that John Hort fought jam with, uh, that's depicted on a slide here from Dave Petraeus, he had available stuff that brigades have never had before. Close air support directly to him, two predators 24-7, shadows, gimblers, aerostats, raid towers, national intelligence assets, and great soldiers. Uh, quite simply, the Army adaptation in, this, in the last 13, 14 years has been incredible. Next chart. However, you know, there's always an however when you bring in a story to talk to you. Um, it's been phenomenal, but it's been focused on a specific range of adversaries. Um, I've given this when I went down at MCOE and other places, and captains always stand up and say, you know, we're the most combat experienced army in the history of the United States. And I said, at this much, this part is waiting for you still. And what we've done is radically adapt in this place and have not paid enough attention to what's on the right side of that. Uh, in the realm of vehicles, we provide life-saving counter ID capabilities, but as shown on these slides, these platforms are limited in the ability to support an expeditionary arm in the future. 
the Crows system in the top, when I was the 82nd, uh, a young battalion took, commander took me around his motor pool and said, I said, you know, I really don't need a dog and pony. He said, no, no, I want to show you something. Okay, great. These are our most capable systems. They cannot be airdropped because they were designed to, as most of our equipment, to be there, and we deployed to our equipment rather than employing with the, and deploying with the equipment. Stryker, uh, when it was first designed and field it has as one of its principal characteristics, it had to be deployable by a C-130. The Stryker now with a double V hull and slat armor, which is what it requires to operate even in a regular environment, can't get on a C-130. Uh, the mission command on the move MRAP in the bottom, and you get a sense of scale because the six foot tall gentleman that's standing next to it is about halfway up the side of it is a principal command and control vehicle in the 101st Airborne. It can't be put on a C-130 and it can't be air assaulted. Um, finally, this is a picture of a division TAC on a recent uh, NCC employment. And ask yourself, is that something that is rapidly deployable? And also, is it something that is you know, able to operate independently without plugging into an existing architecture that's been there for years. Uh, you know, the network that John Hort you know, plugged into had to be there for him to be successful. And, you know, the era I grew up in, which is, you know, the Cold War, this would be thought of as, a, as a large emitting soft target. Next slide. So, I think events in the Ukraine and the Pacific uh, have drawn our attention again to high-end adversaries who have capabilities ranging from small arms to nuclear weapons. My concern is how much we remember how to fight these types of adversaries is a real question the Joint Force is not focused on in a long time. I know the armies were returning to decisive operations, but we really need to get serious about understanding the capability gaps we have against state actors and their proxies that exist right now. Next slide. So, the Russians have not been sleeping. Um, they learned, you know, if you read the literature, the Russian literature about what they've learned in Chechnya and Georgia and the Ukraine, they are a learning organization. Um, they've employed new air defense systems ranging from a a Verba man pads, which we have no countermeasure to, to the S-400, which scares every Air Force pilot I've ever talked to to death. Um, they've also fielded rocket and conventional artillery, as has been their tradition, and they plan for the routine use of chemicals and, and nuclear weapons. The rocket capabilities are particularly formidable and include this not new generation BM-30 300 millimeter MRLS, which has you know, guided uh, precision projectiles that will deploy um, scatterable mines, improved conventional munitions. And they realize that the future of the world is not precision, it is area problems. Uh, and our response is quite frankly, we're about to abandon uh, by treaty our use of improved conventional munitions. For short range targets, they have the TOS-1 MRL uh, that has mounted on a T-72 tank chassis that is very mobile with 30 220 millimeter rockets that have thermobaric warheads. It is a flame weapon for close combat. They've also been improving their armor. The new T-14 Armada has a 125 millimeter gun that's unmanned. Uh, it can fire conventional ammunition, but it can also fire a missile that can engage tanks or low-flying helicopters out to six kilometers with about a 95% chance of hit. Finally, they filled in airborne formations and platforms like the BMD-4, which is shown here, which has a 30 millimeter auto cannon that's coaxially mounted to a 100 millimeter gun that fires high explosive shells or laser beam riding missiles. You know, it's, I am not always the most exciting speaker, but if I could light myself on fire now, I would do it. You know, we have not fought anybody like this since World War II. You know, this is a different adversary that we thought a lot about in the Cold War, but fortunately never had to fight. And I think there's really good chances we may have to fight these guys. Next chart. Or more importantly, even if we deter the Chinese and the Russians, 
you know, we are going to fight their weapons. The Russians export weapons all over the world. We're going to fight their technology. We're going to fight their, their formations in the shape of other people who have been trained by advisors from other countries. And I want to tell you, we have significant capability gaps against these weapon systems. And these vulnerabilities exist today. And they will create operational shock in our army. And they will also create strategic dislocation if we don't get these things right. Next slide. So I want to show you, you know, you may have seen this before, but you know, this is the TOS-1 MRL. Uh, it's, by the way, in use by the Iraqi security forces because we gave them old Warsaw Pact equipment. So it probably means it's also being used by ISIS. Uh, if you've had, how many of y'all read Duffel Blog? There's a great joke in there the other day about, you know, we ought to just give weapons directly to ISIS and avoid the middleman of the Iraqi security forces to be much more effective. Costs a lot less to ship them. Okay, go ahead. Поражение цели 6 секунд. Тяжелая огневая система ТОС-1А называется по-доброму Буратино. На самом деле мобильное, не очень большое, но весьма грозное оружие. Эти учения проводят в степях, чтобы детально изучить новые образцы. Полигон обстреливают модернизированными ракетами увеличенной дальности. Транспортно-заряжающая машина в течение полутора минут заполняет огневую систему. Для управления всем процессом нужен один пульт. Сейчас для огнеметной роты важно отработать наведение и пуск реактивных неуправляемых снарядов. От меткости наводчика зависит поражение мишени. Все остальные показатели, расстояние, траекторию okay. и даже ветер рассчитывают. So, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the work I did on Israel and Lebanon and Gaza because I think it's directly relevant here. Um, and just to give you a short background on what happened in the war. So in 2006, Hezbollah kidnapped a couple of Israeli soldiers on the border, took them back into Lebanon. Uh, the Israelis thought this was part of a coordinated new type of strategy by Hamas and Hezbollah, because a soldier had been kidnapped in Gaza before this. So the initial approach was uh, with the idea if it practiced Israeli defense forces of immediate you know, fire campaign. Uh, mostly with the air, but also with artillery. And in the aftermath of this, the Hezbollah starts firing rockets into Israel. Lots of rockets. The last day of the campaign, 200 rockets hit Israel right before the ceasefire. So the issue was, from the air, you could not see the rockets that were being employed that were short range, because they were hidden. Uh, many of them were in, I'll show you a picture in a second. So the army went in. Uh, and the army was doing raids, uh, had been engaged in a concept called systemic operational design. The order that the company commanders received was, you know, we will attack like a swarm of wasps to disrupt the consciousness of the adversary. And company commanders didn't think that was really good guidance uh, and didn't know what they were supposed to do. They had not trained in a long time. Um, so the last operation here, quite frankly, is, the, is an air assault. Uh, the Israelis hadn't practiced air assaults in a battalion level in forever. Uh, so they got off late, got in late, and right before BMNT, as the sun's coming up, the last helicopter pulls up and is knocked out of the air by an SA-7. And you know, the Israeli army looks ineffectual. It is the first time in the history of Israel that there wasn't a decisive victory in the aftermath. Uh, it really causes enormous deterrence issues. Uh, and the Israeli army went about, and I wrote about this in Hard Fighting, completely re you know, invigorating combined arms fire maneuver inside the Israeli army and air ground integration. Because they knew that's what was gonna be needed to solve the problem next time. So next chart. So the question is how did they ever get to this place? You know, the vaunted Israeli military from the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War. As much, I mean, I think it's a, what interested me that, about this, other than it's a fascinating case study, is that it is us. It's the same kind of mentality in the West of policymakers believing they are beyond the age of you know, major wars in which ground forces will be involved. You know, Kosovo, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, 
it convinced policymakers that you could do everything by air and ISR, and it's a, you know, it's really attractive. Promises less casualties, less collateral damage, and you save a lot of money because you're not training and maintaining readiness in a large ground force. I'll be honest with you, you know, if in 2005, you know, giving the information everybody had, it seemed like a pretty legitimate decision. Plus, they had the option, you know, there's 100,000 Americans in Iraq, so if they get it wrong, you know, they know there's a, they can hedge and work back to whatever they need. So I believe this is what, you know, the, these are really bad assumptions. Uh, and I believe many Western states have made the same assumptions, and they're playing out in places like Libya, Syria, Iraq, Ukraine, and elsewhere. Because it is, anything's better than boots on the ground. Next chart. Um, so this slide shows several of the insights. I mean, the Hezbollah was not 10 feet tall. It turns out there's only 4,000 fighters. The Israelis put close to 40,000 soldiers in southern Lebanon. But it did present this problem, and I'll talk about this later. We talked about it before lunch. A problem they had not thought about solving. Uh, most important was the, the challenge I've already mentioned about competent, you know, organized adversaries with standoff weapons. Uh, key to isolating the battlefield was air. So air has a big role in this. Uh, it also was key to hunting long and medium range rockets. But they could not find and take care of this problem in the bottom of the chart, which are short range rockets and in many cases were on kitchen timers. There was nobody there to go after. You had to go disarm every one of these rocket launchers. There's also a scale issue. Um, so when you look at Lebanon on a map, or you look at the Ukraine on a map, it looks not so big, right? I mean, it's, well, the Ukraine is actually about 45 kilometers by 45, or excuse me, southern Lebanon is 45 by 45. And it's, one of the things I would advise everybody here, translate this operational problem into a political problem. And I, this was a metaphor and an analogy I used with OSD policy when I was briefing this work said, you know, imagine the problem is being going from Fredericksburg, Virginia to Woodbridge and having to clear 45 kilometers to the west of I-95 and there's 10,000 people there with anti-tank guided missiles and man pads that want to kill you. You know, that's where you commute something. Would that be hard? Yeah, that'd be hard. So make them visualize you know, the problem in a way they can understand and say, so if we really did badly at this, would that be a problem for you politically? And so what do we have to do to get ready for these kinds of operations? Um, the top piece here shows a limit of the Israeli advance. There were tons of rocket sites still going on. And one of the key issues is the Israeli military had been preparing for a existing threat that was very challenging with the intifadas in, in Gaza. And they became consumed with low intensity conflict. Uh, they came to believe that fighting was training uh, and the suicide bombers and terrorists were about as bad as they get. And Hezbollah changed their mind about that. Training was a huge issue because tank crews had not maneuvered uh, in probably 20 years. So when they were taken under fire in Wadi Saluki uh, by anti-tank guided missiles, they didn't know how to deploy their smoke dischargers. They didn't know any battle drills. They did not understand, they didn't have active protection on most of the vehicles at that time. And they immediately stopped, you know, action to evacuate casualties while the fight was still going on. A friend of mine in uh, the in Israeli Defense Forces said that, you know, for years before this operation, they would get requests from battalion and brigade commanders to turn their mortars, toes, heavy machine guns in because they never used them, they had to maintain them. So we've been talking about, you know, I mean, I've been talking about the lessons of this since 2007. So we've been talking about a lot of these problems for a long time. I think we need to start doing something about them, about the dot mil PFP implications of these kinds of adversaries who are out there waiting for us right now. Next slide. So what the second Lebanon war did was highlight what a kind of a regular force can become when a state gives them state-like capabilities. Not an Air Force, not a Navy, but rockets and anti-tank guided missiles and man pads. Uh, so there's a limit to what they can do, 
and they create challenges and opportunities, quite frankly, because there's things that they can't counter that we have. But this is a similar, this is something that you can do for uh, in a regular adversary overnight almost. We did this when we gave you know, Stingers, Milan missiles, and other direct fire systems to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And I think what's, how many people have seen Charlie Wilson's war? Everybody, how many helicopters did the Soviets lose? A lot. They lost 333 aircraft total in the entire war, which is nothing. We lost, you know, as a counter to that, the Air Force lost 2,400 fixed-wing aircraft over Vietnam, and the Army lost 5,000 helicopters. It wasn't the losing of the helicopters. It just, the Stinger created an environment in which the Soviets could no longer operate because they knew if they tried to operate, they'd lose helicopters. And they could not stop the flow of weapons in for Pakistan. There's an es estimate from the Soviet staff. It would take 600,000 more soldiers to secure the border with Pakistan. They couldn't support the 100-and-something thousand they had inside of Afghanistan already. So losses are not the issue. The issue was the operational concept and the technologies employed to solve the problem were now patently inadequate to deal with the problem. And I'd say, the, you know, as I said earlier about the, the rise of the, the Russian threat, you know, we haven't fought anybody like this since Vietnam. When we engaged NV, NVA uh, forces and VC main force units. Next slide. So what do these tell us about the types of adversaries we're going to face? I think you know, we're going to face these folks in the middle because the high-end problem is, you know, is one that you know, hopefully we can deter. But these proxy fights against Hezbollah, Hamas, ISIS, and others are there, and we're going to see them in the future. Uh, we're going to see the standoff piece. We're also going to see, as we're seeing with ISIL, these adversaries moving to places where our air and ISR capabilities are not effective. Uh, like ISIS and Mosul. It can force changes in operational methods. Uh, you don't fly helicopters uh, in this environment the way we have tended to do because it gets shot down. But the other question, you know, the other important issue about this, these are adversaries that can put battalions at risk, not platoons and squads. Um, the bottom of this picture is a picture of a, a motorized rifle regiment in the Ukrainian army. It was hit by a grot attack. Um, Phil Carver was there when this happened. Regiment disappeared. Killed 20, wounded 200, destroyed a lot of vehicles, and they were combat ineffective in 10 seconds. Um, i talking with a sergeant major at the National Train, uh, in Detroit from the National Training Center the other day. He said, you know, the same kind of thing that happened in Wadi Saluki is happening with our army at NTC. So he was there with a rotation. To, a vehicle got hit. Immediately, the company commander sent a vehicle to go do Kazovac. It got hit. So he sent another one, which it got hit. A total of six vehicles being hit because you haven't solved the problem of the attacker before you start taking care of the wounded. Um, a battalion commander in the A second told me this is a mindset we've developed. It's almost like our operations have become discretionary. So if there's something that's going to cause a real, you know, if we know there's a lot of IEDs that have been implanted, we will defer the operation because it's, it's not necessary. These are operations that there are no longer discretionary. When you're under fire against this kind of adversary, you have to act. Next slide. So let me show you a couple of clips here about what's being used in the world that we're going to see. Um, first one is an anti-tank guided missile. Uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency in a recent report said there's been 958 videos on the internet, separate videos showing anti-tank guided missile use in Syria um, as of April 2015. And I want you to watch how easy this is to train somebody to use this and how effective it is. And also notice for some reason it's a US tow missile. Start it up. <laughs> I'm 
صار حركة حزم حندرات الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر العزه الله okay stop الله اكبر really disturbed this guy's smoke break on the other tank i think but uh... So the anti-tank guided missile threat and the rocket-propelled grenade threats with dual-shaped warheads have gotten a great deal of attention in every country except ours. Uh, these systems for active protection are, quite frankly, I think the only solution to stopping this threat. Uh, there are all sorts of, you know, the, the arguments about why not to do it because they'll fire volleys or all these other things. You want to stop the first one and have good battle drills like the Israelis have developed, where as soon as I have one, you know, these will handle multiple warheads, but as soon as that happens, I don't just sit there and hope my active protection works. I pop my smoke discharges, I start maneuvering, doing battle drills. The things that, you know, where you start to seize the initiative back from this guy shooting the ATGM. Um, so the Israelis have fielded trophy. The Russians are on their third generation of active protection. Um, they have arena on almost all their systems. The U.S. Iron Curtain system in the bottom left down here was tested by TARP in 2013 with a 100% stop rate against RPG-7s. Uh, and we have nothing in the budget to field these things. Next slide. So I want to show you just a quick clip of how effective these things actually are. Go ahead and start it. By the way, is this Korean TV? На выпущенной мной реактивной гранате была установлена кумулятивная боевая часть, способная пробить броню толщиной до полуметра. Скорость ее полета более 200 метров в секунду. Комплекс активной защиты «Арена» сработал как часы. Здесь видно, как защитный боеприпас выстреливает из пусковой шахты и превращает снаряд в очень красивый все. The next slide. So I've already talked about the rocket threat, and I think, you know, this, you know, I was in a conference in Berlin, or Berlin on the hybrid threat with the, their Minister of Defense all day and 20 other people. And I think you know, most of Europe is in denial about what's going on, because we talked about the hybrid threat, and Frank Hoffman said, you know, like, you are talking about the Russians, right? And he said, yes, but it's ambiguous warfare, it's gray warfare. I said, and my comment was, no, it's not an ambiguous at all for the Russians. It's confusion as hell for you, but they're not confused about what they're doing. What you gotta figure out is, you know, what you do about what they're doing. So this is a picture of a Grad K, the one in the very back. What's important about the Grad K, only the Russian military has the Grad K. The other Grads that are mounted on Ural trucks in the foreground are with the Russian separatists. So there is an interspersing of Russian capabilities inside the separatist operations. Go ahead and start it. This guy is their fire direction center. And he tells the camera, look away, because we're gonna the Russians gonna leave. Okay. So the other thing that's being done in the Ukraine is they're using small unmanned aerial systems to detect targets, to give corrections, and then to do battle damage assessment. Um, 
And this is kind of a middle of the road Russian capability. This is not their high end rocket capability. Uh, and these are, you know, for those who've studied the Soviet Union, Russia is the same way. I mean, they believe in artillery and they believe in rocket artillery. And many of their systems are equipped with you know, chemical and nuclear warheads. Um, and I think this is a, another training issue. So every unit I've visited in the last year, I've asked, you know, what are you doing about training in a mop? So well, we don't. Most units don't even have mop training gear anymore. And the gear we have is stuff that's 16, 17 years old. I mean, it has the Woodland BDU. I mean, we've had like 17 uniform changes since the Woodland BDU. And, you know, but that's what we're giving our soldiers to get ready to go to places like Syria and Russia. Next slide. Finally, you know, the threat that I think is probably the most serious, um, not for ground forces, but for the Army in general, is the man pad threat. Uh, there are thousands of loose man pads in the Middle East uh, from Libya's collapse and from captured from, you know, our, the well-equipped army we left behind in Iraq. Uh, and it, this will show you how easy it is to use these things. Go ahead. الله أكبر التفت لعجتنا الله أكبر لواء أول مدرعات كتلة الشهيد الشيخ عصام الصالح دفاع جوي الله أكبر لواء أول مدرعات كتلة الشهيد الشيخ عصام الصالح دفاع جوي سوف تقوم بإطلاق صاروخ حراري على حوامة الله أكبر وما رميت إذ رميت ولكن الله رمى الله أكبر 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 الله I hope you've gotten the point by this time that you know this is out there right now. Uh, this middle kind of adversary is something that you know is proliferating, and I think we need to really start thinking about minding the middle, because if you can deal with this hybrid adversary with these kinds of systems, you're much better postured to deal with the high end if it occurs. Um, and I think these adversaries are going to rise in North Korea, North Africa, throughout the Middle East where they're already at, the Ukraine. And they could you know, actually be the problem we face eventually in North Korea. The strategy is clear. Create the kind of war Western societies abhor. Cause large numbers of casualties. Take charge of the narrative on the media. And take advantage of reluctance of the Western states to put boots on the ground. Uh, these conflicts are not necessarily insurgencies. So much of what we've learned in the past 12 years about how to deal with that kind of adversary is still relevant to that kind of adversary, but it may be irrelevant against this kind of adversary. Finally, these adversaries often go to ground, like I said, in complex terrain and urban terrain. Next chart. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the urban combat problem. Um, is it, you know, it has been a perennial problem since the dawn of history, since the fall of Troy. It is this issue of, in wars between states, capitals are often the center of gravity. In large urban areas, uh, the work we did for the chief last year in the strategic studies group on megacities uh, is where people are going to be in the future. Uh, I think there's, a, you know, there's an issue of categorizing them as megacities. You know, 10 million and above is a megacity by definition. Baghdad looked pretty hard at 7 million. And I want to talk about, you know, solder cities we go through this. 
But it's a really difficult problem because maneuvers canalize, the adversary has a positional advantage often, and we've always approached these as objectives that have to be cleared and taken. Uh, if you look at you know, large urban areas, you can't imagine clearing and taking Seoul um, or many of the other large cities in the world. Next chart. So I'm not, you know, this is the way we used to do it. Uh, Fallujah and Grozny are pretty much prototypical case studies in the last 20 years. And so they're geographically isolated. You shrink the problem by telling all the non-combatants to leave. So in the case of Fallujah, there were 300,000 people in the city, 270,000 left. And so the rules are now, the are we, you know, if you stay in the city, you're a terrorist and we're gonna come kill you. And that's okay because all the non-combatants are gone. Uh, it was a tough fight. We're doing work for, you know, for y'all on the Battle of Fallujah and what the implications were and large implications for the future. But one of the clear implications was mobile protected firepower and tactics that employed that advantage were central to one big outcome. Of the 80 dead U.S. military and 600 wounded, of the 80, 72 were Marines and 95% of the wounded Marines because they went in through the front door and lived with their chin and had to claim every room with a you know, stack of soldiers or Marines. Uh, Jim Rainey was the battalion commander there, and he said the way we cleared the rooms, we disappeared the building uh, because that was the problem. Uh, same thing in Grozny. The Russians told everybody to leave, started an you know, artillery barrage and air support. And what they eventually did was divide the city into a spoked wheel and went from each spoke to each spoke, flattening everything in their way. The MRL I showed you earlier, the TOS-1, was used in direct fire to level city blocks throughout, and finally the, you know, the Chechen rebels departed. Next slide. So the work I've been trying to do on urban stuff is, you know, is there a better way to do this? And Gaza and Sadr City, I think, point the way to the future. Uh, and it's, you know, this Sir Julian Corbett and some principles of maritime strategy in 1911, I think, had it right. It's better strategy to make the enemy come to you than go to him and seek a decision on his own ground. In other words, how do you create a condition where you're not going into the enemy's position of advantage but making him come into yours? Next chart. So I'm gonna talk really quickly about Sauter City because it's, it is the only urban operation other than sieges where you threw diseased cows into the city and everybody died of smallpox that you didn't actually go into the city. Um, so on 23 March, rockets start firing into the, into the green zone. And part of this is really ironically because of geography. If you look at Sauter City, um, below Route Goal, which is Cood Street, the, which actually the Jamila Market and Tharwa are about the range of a 107 rocket. So if you can clear them out of those areas, you, inf you take away the ability to do indirect fires against the green zone. And when embassies are being hit by rockets, it gets people's attention. Uh, so this starts on the 23rd of March, and we tried to figure out why it did start then, not on the 25th, because Maliki is moving to Basra, and Muqtala Sadr says, he's coming to fight, so we're gonna fight back. Um, half of the Iraqi checkpoints in this area are overrun immediately, uh, and this gets Maliki's attention. Um, so he orders the coalition forces to stop the rocket firing. Next chart. So this is the 3rd Brigade Combat Team mission. Um, pretty clear, uh, the decisive terrain is the 107 millimeter rocket boxes. Uh, one, two SCR is the unit was charged with doing this. Will Grimsley was the ADC, got him together and said, so what's your plan? And this is where understanding the problem comes in. So Will said, you know, what's your plan? The guys told him, you know, we're gonna do this slowly because we wanna, don't wanna cause collateral damage. Don't want to, and he said, well, what's your fire support plan? Well, we don't have one because we're in counterinsurgency. And he said, well, where are your mortars? Well, they're back at the FOB because we're refitting the strikers and we never use them, so we got them refitted first. He said, well, who can like direct an M1 tank to fire around? Well, that has to be the company commander or higher. Well, who can fire a Hellfire? Well, the battalion commander has to clear that, probably the brigade commander. He says, 
Okay, and this is Monty Python Warford, now for something completely different. He said, so when you come around a corner and someone comes out with an RPG, the guy who decides to engage, that would be the gunner. And it took, instead of two days to do this, two weeks. And it was a hard, tough fight. Um, and one of the company commanders is a battalion commander. His father was a battalion commander in Hawaii. He kept getting, which I, you know, I don't know if I could have operated with everybody sending me text messages from America about how's the fight going, how many are you killing, you know, what. And the kid finally, you know, sort of, he gave me all his emails when we did the study. He said, so on the first day, my RWS on my strikers, I killed 100. And I quit counting because it didn't matter. He went black on 50 cal every day he was engaged. Next chart. So he gets a Royal Gold, and you know, Sauter City is a warren of alleys, and people kept flowing in and kept shooting rockets. And so John Hort said, you know, we got to do what we did the rest of Baghdad, wall off the, you know, the good street so the guy can't infiltrate. And they start doing this. And it was, you know, the critical lesson from this engagement, he created a condition Jam could not tolerate. Because everything Jam needed was in General Lamarck and Tharwa, and they came out to contest the wall. Because if the wall went up, it was over for them. And as you know, one of the folks we interviewed said, you know, we were like, we didn't realize, but we were like a Roman siege engine pulling up to Sauter City with this wall. And they had to come do something about it or it's gonna be over for them. And they came out and fought. And you can see the number of, I mean, this is a, a real gunfight, 12,000 25 millimeter rounds, 800 main gun rounds, 700 dead jam that they saw die. Uh, and this created a condition, as you can see the wall on the bottom, the red dots are engagements. By the time this is over and the wall's up, there are no more engagements and there's very little jam left. Next slide. So Gaza is very similar to this in that the Israelis did not want to own Gaza City. In 2005, they gave Gaza back to the Palestinians. So they don't want to own Gaza. They just don't want rockets coming out of Gaza. So their plan, and this was, everybody said at the time that, you know, the Israelis reacted to rocket fire and it was really a surprise. The reality is that the Israelis have been in their national training center for two months before this, planning and preparing for it, looking for a provocation, because this is a way to demonstrate the Israeli Defense Force had its act together again. Airborne Brigade in the north, uh, their best mechanized infantry units from the east, and an armored brigade that cuts off everything south of Gaza City. They go in, they take out the initial prepared positions, and they start doing patrols, large patrols which makes Hamas come out and fight them, and they kill them when they come out. They figured out how to agitate the adversary and how to engage them. Next chart. So I think what's radically different here is that, you know, the city is not the problem. The population is not the problem. The problem is the adversary who's fighting you from the cover of the city. So what's really important here, this is not a you know, seize and hold and clear mission. This is a wide area security mission. Where the way I establish security is I get rid of the guys that are causing the problem. Uh, you have to make the adversary visible. You have to create a condition he can't tolerate. Uh, and it's done by making a condition that this guy has to react to. And the wall was a classic example in Sauter City. Hunting enemy leaders is really fundamental to this. Uh, something JSOC did in Baghdad, which really eroded the capacity and capability of, of JAM and other fighters. But the other piece of this is that the enemy is fleeting. Uh, he understands if he's decisively engaged, he can't stand up. So mission command, real mission command of enabling leaders to do what they think is right in the moment. And pushing capabilities down to brigades is really important. Finally, I think what the Israelis found out, there was a big to-do after the war about they lost tanks. And the Israeli reaction to this was they built 350 more Merkava tanks and they started the Namir armored personnel carrier system. And because what they realized is, yeah, they lost tanks, they didn't lose a lot of soldiers, and nothing else can survive in this kind of battlefield. Next chart. 
So the last thing I say here on this is that, you know, I have asked every audience I've talked to, and in cases some 800 people, and said, so what do you think about the Battle of Sutter City? So how many people here even know we had a fight in Sutter City? And like 50 hands out of 400 go up. So we don't even know our own history. And so how can we have institutionalized the lessons from these fights if we haven't studied them yet? And the bigger question to me is that when we actually do expeditionary operations, we're not going to be able to set the theater in a way where we've got two years to develop the infrastructure so John Hoare can do what he did in Sauter City. Next chart. So the last piece on this is that armor's important. Uh, I did a, a book a number of years ago called In the Middle of the Fight about medium armored forces. And if you look at any conflict since the Spanish Civil War, you know, armor has been a key ingredient in being able to seize the initiative and operate effectively. Uh, I think the other lesson that's come really clear from the Israelis is that you have to have a joint integrated air ground ISR system. I don't think we do anymore. Um, I've talked to folks, you know, captains and majors that say, uh, we're doing, you know, joint combined arms operations all the time in Afghanistan. Now, you know, fixing someone and dropping a bomb on them is not integrated air ground operations. Uh, in an area where you have an air threat to our air, a man pad threat, you know, where we're moving through standoff, it is not the orchestration of the battle space that we've, we've been doing. Next chart. So I've only touched on some of the major challenges we have. Um, I hope everybody's you know, not just awake, but not scared to death. Um, but this, you know, the other piece of this is, you know, the cyber threat, unmanned system, GPS, jammers, all of those stuff, I got that. But the job of the Army is to get into close combat and, and destroy the enemy. Uh, I think that's what we need to work on first and create conditions inside formations where you can operate no matter what the cyber threat. Um, to counter these capabilities, you know, I think there's, there's a short list here. Many of them are materiel. Uh, I don't know why Dan Gray wrote an article the other day. I don't know why, nor does he. We haven't got active protection on every system in the Army. It's been around for years. Um, getting a counterfire system that can find and destroy rockets beyond 100 kilometers. Our new counterfire system sees out to about 60. So maybe we can put two of them together and see far enough. Uh, fielding counter UAS systems and counter rocket defenses, and equipping our aviators with high end manned pads defense systems, which you know, can stop these new man pads that are being fielded. Uh, there are many more capability gaps that are out there we need to look at, but I think these are the fundamental ones that will enable us to operate in these environments, and we need to get after it. Next chart. This is the last one, I promise. Uh, in closing, I want to just emphasize once again that our adversaries know our capabilities. I'm not so sure we really know theirs. And they know our vulnerabilities. And they are designing ways to defeat us. Uh, in some critical areas, quite frankly, we're overmatched. And if we're going to do as we say in the new Army vision of preparing for the full range of operations, the first step we need to do is understand who we're going to fight and how we counter the capabilities. I don't know who specifically we're going to fight in the future, but I can tell you what every country in the world has as capabilities and doctrine. It is available. Your G2 knows this as well as I do. I think they can be clustered in these three various levels of adversary based on their capabilities. And so an army has to be conceptually ready to counter those separate categories of adversaries. Um, to paraphrase Clausewitz, which you know, everybody here who knows military historians know you have to do once in a briefing, um, we have to understand the wars we could be in. Uh, and a, an important first step in doing that is to understand our capability gaps, uh, and this is a problem we have to solve. And I think we talked about this before lunch. Understanding the problem is fundamental to solving the problem. You can't talk generically about the world 
uh, you have to have a problem to solve. And, the, and this is a, the classic case of this is the, you know, the use of air and armor and radios in World War II, uh, where the Germans were the only army that got it right with the blitzkrieg because they're the only army that had an offensive problem to solve that they encountered in World War I in the spring offenses where they actually had tactical success, low-end operational success, and someone you know, finally realized that you can't walk to Paris faster than the adversary can close the gaps with his interior lines. So the answer to this was, how do you replace man and animal power with mechanization? Because the problem was, how do I knock France out of the war first and then deal with the East? As it's always been for the Germans ever since they were unified. So this, you know, the, if that's the problem, mechanization and motorization fall, you know, solves the manpower, animal power problem. And the rate of advance you know, makes artillery hard to keep up. So air power solves that problem. And the way you link them together is radios. Nobody else did this. Um, I think the Army warfighting challenges get after these problems, but I think they need to be focused more on specific adversaries that present these problems. And many of these gaps require technical solutions. But I think others are fundamentally intellectual shortfalls. It requires us to say we have a problem. You know, it's, it, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, my name is you know, Arctic and I can't, you know, I have a hybrid warfare problem. What are the 12 steps to get to a solution? So this is not unlike, you know, for those who've been inflicted with fast tanks and heavy bombers, this is not unlike what happened with the U.S. Army in the interwar period. We focused on our own concepts and our own capabilities and didn't look at what the adversary could do. So if you watch, you know, probably the best movie about World War II, even though it's got Brad Pitt in it, is Fury. And I show this in my class at Georgetown, the fight between the Shermans and the Tiger I. Uh, and this was everyday occurrence in the drive into Europe. And you know, if it had been a Tiger II, they never would have got the job done. A Tiger II, could, you, know, you could put the front of the 75 millimeter gun on a Sherman against the front glacis of a Tiger II and it wouldn't penetrate. A Tiger II could hit a Sherman at 2,500 meters, first shot, and knock it out. Um, and we had the same kind of assumptions about air power where flying B-17 formations could self-protect. And 55,000 airmen and 9,000 heavy bombers later, we realized that that was a problem. So as in the war since 9-11, the, you know, the solution to these challenges are, are intellectual. Uh, they are for the people who generate the ideas of the Army, which are the people in this room to get after. And I think you know time is short, and we need to get after it really quickly. So thanks for your time and attention, and you know I'll look forward to your questions. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Simeon Ward, I'm the Australian Army Liaison Officer here at Headquarters Tridoc. Um, thank you very much for the insights you've given us in terms of the complex operating environment and some of the threat weapon systems in particular that are out there. One of the luxuries that we have though, uh, and this is in thinking context of the Israeli example, is that we're deployable armies. Uh, it's not that theirs isn't, but it's deployable within their own country or to their own borders. What are some of the takeaways that we need to address in order to ensure that our systems that can counter these threats can be delivered where we need them, where we need them? Yeah, I mean, the, this has always been the, so when you see the Israeli operating, you know, army operating, you see a big blue cable going back to the local area network because they're really close to home. Um, it's a different challenge, but the problem's the same. Uh, the variable is distance. Um, and the other good thing is relative to them is that you're facing like you know, five different adversaries simultaneously mm -hmm. and so what's interesting about them they don't get to kind of like pick where on the range of operations they want to focus because they're all there and they're there every day mm -hmm. the one they haven't solved is a distance issue which is Iran 
So if you take this into account as a variable and say, you know, my problem is I'm going to face these, these kinds of adversaries somewhere else, that's just something that's part of your problem you've got to solve. Um, but I think the, the question for the Army, I mean, the, the challenge the Army has always had is it doesn't have its own strategic lip. And we've been round and round in trade talk about we ought to have that. You're not going to get it. Okay. Well, maybe you will. Maybe the seven consecutive recurring miracles will happen simultaneously. But so this is a given that you, know, you have a deployment constraint. And you have to think about how do I you know, create the capabilities I need that are deployable and can operate in austere environments and be successful. Um, so yeah, it's, it's easier in a distance way for Israel. It's actually harder in another way because being close to 30,000 short range rockets is a challenge I don't particularly want to face. It's like having you know, 30,000 rockets in San Diego and would that get your attention? Did I answer your question? Okay. Sir, thanks uh, for your presentation today. Sir, what would you advise us regarding our perhaps over infatuation with the network as we look at these problems? Because I didn't really see that in your list of things to get after. Yeah, I, I, mean, I showed the what I was trying to get after was the solder city thing with the last chart about you know we can't do that unless we're somewhere for a long time. So I think, you know, it's, we were talking uh, at lunch. So I was a brigade FSO in the 1st Armored Division in 1980, and the gnarliest guy I've ever known in my life is my brigade commander, Nick Andriacchio, former Sergeant First Class on OCS about this tall, and would just, you know, thump you every chance he got about, you know, this isn't the Vietnam War, this is an armored warfare environment, and we got to get after it. We got to be fast because the Soviets are going to fire rockets. They're going to do all this stuff. So our brigade tack was my 577, his three's 577, one extension, a jeep, and an M60 tank. That was everything we had. A bunch of radios in the 577s, and I realize the network is creates more demands and all this other stuff. But what you got to get after, I think, is what is the minimum, you know. A capability you need inside of a formation to operate. Not know everything in the universe. I mean, the picture I showed of the you know the division TAC. I mean, I, it just is mind-boggling that we think that's an expeditionary command and control headquarters for a combat unit. So, what do you? What is the minimum amount of connectivity you need? We did some work the first year in the SSG and said, you know. The way to solve the cyber problem is not be in the network. If you really want to do mission command, I mean, if we're serious about telling, you know, formation commanders, you know, here's your mission, go execute, and it's a brigade fight, you know, they don't need to be hooked into every system in the world from the president down to, you know, whoever else can get on the network. And we've actually created vulnerabilities with this instead of capability. And we could do it. I mean, it, it made perfect sense in the wars we've been in. And if we go back to that kind of war, do it again. More is better. But in the war which I think we're going to be in, you know, this creates vulnerabilities, not capability. So what we recommend, I mean, I had a guy who was a PhD. From, we had really good kids for sure. And all the years I was there. PhD from MIT in information technology. Another guy was a cognitive psychologist to analyze networks. So what you need in a brigade is a system that can talk to everyone in the brigade because it's so powerful that nobody can disrupt it, and a backup to GPS that's inertial guidance for timing and location. And so you can, you don't want to operate independently, but if you have to, you can. It's a backup system, essentially. And, you know, I mean, we used to, you know, in the good old days, my network was running a wire line as a backup to my radio. So what is that wire line in the future that if I lose my radios, I can still communicate and execute? Um, if you look at, and we were talking about this at lunch, what are we buying? Okay, I mean, one of the questions we had uh, at this session this morning was, well, you know, if we ask for more capabilities, OSD would just tell us to reprioritize because there's no more money. Maybe. 
But there are things that we're buying out there. I mean, we went to DARPA, and it's an Army-funded project that is being built by a, a place in Boston. It's a steerable 50 caliber sniper round. And so I said, why do you need that? It's not the silver bullet. It's the platinum bullet with diamonds. Because they each cost $10,000. And you know, how many times are you going to have a situation where a sniper has to hit a high value target moving in the open in the future? And the pro it's not just the cost of the round, it's the cost of the program. If you look at the, the things we're buying, we are still focused, since our acquisition system takes so long to produce something, the requirements that are in the system are still there from five years ago. So we're buying stuff to give the squad one more meter of situational awareness. And you know, I think, you know, I went through the squad as a foundation of the Army discussion, and it's really important in a regular warfare. In this kind of warfare, unfortunately, Squads are precious currency you may have to spend to, make, to attain objectives, where you have to push through the mission. So what are the capabilities you need above the squad to make it where you don't have to spend that currency unless you absolutely have to? Um, so if you go through a list of the programs that you know, the Army's doing in the ASALT, the portfolio review, most of them are on the network. And it's like polishing this diamond even more. And we've polished it so much that you know it gets scratched, and I'm not sure it's when I want to give to somebody as an engagement ring. So I think there's things that you know what, and like I said, I'll light myself on fire here if I have to. But you know, you guys are the only folks in the army that can get after this, and say you know what is it going to take for a brigade commander to hit the ground, start communicating, and deal with this kind of adversary. You know, immediately. And it is not more situational awareness and technology and networks. It is what does he need minimally to operate in this environment. And more in some cases is worse. I mean, I have friends of mine at the NCC said, you know, said, you know, brigades show up, it takes eight hours to set up a talk. And they can't hook into the network because they don't have everything in the brigade that enables them to be in the network. That's a real problem. If we're talking about early arriving brigades going immediately into operations, you know, and this, I guess the other piece is that the Army's in a very egalitarian organization. You know, that's, you know, no haves and have nots. I mean, I've heard this for years. Who is gonna be on the tip of the spear? Who are the first formations that are gonna go do something? You know, that's where you start with experimentation and fielding because you can't, replace everything all at once. But the 5th Brigade in doesn't have the same problem that the 1st Brigade in has. Anyway, it's a long, complicated, wandering, meandering answer. But I, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. As my wife, you know, as an example, she changed companies. And the company she was working for took the image off her computer so her computer was destroyed. Because, oh, we won't hurt anything in it, but you know, really. And she had to get a new iPhone got a new personal computer, got a new work computer, and the systems integration dilemma in our household for two weeks was almost unbearable. So I can imagine what it's like for some guy deploying, trying to put a brigade tack in without all the associated infrastructure. So it's, it is an, an issue, I think. Thanks. Dr. Johnson, I always love to hear you talk. Uh, we learn so much every time we listen to you. I would only, the only thing I would, only critique I would give you is that the threat's actually worse than you described it. Um, but I do have a question. I'm so myself in the face now, I guess. Yeah, no, it's it's, uh, it's brilliant. Um, okay, so if, the, if the, we're looking at a future where we don't know what we're going to have to do, based upon your last comment about doing experimentation with the first forces to be deployed. Should the Army be thinking about, we're not a boutique force, but maybe we should be a collection of boutique forces where we have specialized expertises for specialized problems? So this is the, you know, this is almost like the tracks versus wheels argument. You know, that 
everybody has every 20 years. Um, so I think the the issue here is, you know, it's a specialization of, or general purpose question. Um, I'm really, I'm doing some work for the Army Medical Department about global health engagement, not because I you know, much care about global health engagement, but we're gonna learn a lot about how to understand, how to document, you know, places they go and do, th and they get into places the regional armed forces will never get in because they're asked for in many cases. So they're, what we're trying to make them understand is, you know, you have to document what you did. And if you, if part of this is building relationships and understand where you're going, you know, you ought to be doing that. Uh, so we talked to the, the brigade that went to Africa on the first RAP thing and said, so what do y'all do? 90 engagements. So what were they? Well, they were 90. And I said, well, you know, and there was a major came up to me and said, so I was in Ghana for a month and it was really great. I learned all this stuff and said, well, who knows you're in Ghana? Well, what do you mean, sir? He said, my brigade commander knows. He said, no, I mean, like, who does the army, five years from now, does the army know you were in Ghana? Um, I have a fellow from last year that was in the war college and his seminar is a guy that's fluent in Japanese bilingual, his mother was Japanese, his father was a soldier, and he was raised in a bilingual household. Two seminars down as a Japanese exchange student, the Army doesn't know they exist in the same building. So it would have been good to have that guy sitting next to the Japanese exchange student all year long. So what I'm getting to here is that regional land forces have great promise to do exactly what you're saying, to understand the place that you may go if you're aligned against the region, you know who the adversaries there are. You don't have to be specialized, it's your metal. You may have different capabilities because the adversary presents different problems than the other places. But if we really do engagement, regional alignment, deep focus on the problems, our formations start to think about the place they may go, who they might fight, start requiring, you know, creating requirements for what it needs to defeat that guy. So you're not really specialized, you're focused. And I think there's a difference because you know, when you start folk specializing, you know, there's like how many countries in the world? So I need a guy that's an expert and an expert. I think the, and, you know, the, I'm not thumping my own chest here, but I think the understanding that there are really three broad kinds of adversaries that we have to think about fighting and it's based on their capabilities, not our capabilities. And when you start aligning formation to those places, they look at those adversaries and say, this is what I need to do. Anyway, again, I don't give short answers, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'd actually like to address um, some of the issues about the types of forces that we have. And you talked about the deployability, lethality, and survivability. The reality is, is that, you know, not all forces can look the same. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and therefore not all equipment is going to look the same. Uh, I, I think if we're going to be a, uh, a deployable organization, which we are, uh, then we have to have forces that are able to deploy via air movement. Uh, but then if you take a look at the percentage of equipment that actually moves right. to an to a theater of operation, it is most of it goes by sea. Right. Uh, so therefore, you, you've got to find that fine balance of survivability and lethality that you can stick on an airplane, because we're not at the point yet where everything is really light and real lethal. Um, and then the remainder of it's got to go via, uh, via sea. Uh, and then, right. you know, set up our staging area and then move forward. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's the way we've got to do it. So I think there's got to be recognition that we have to design our forces to be theater opening, followed by a, uh, a follow-on force that was actually with real capabilities to be able to do that. And I agree with all that. Um, so the thing I would add to it is some of this stuff should have been on ships a long time ago to be pre-positioned. Uh, you're not going to get, that has been the perennial problem for, you know, the Israelis don't have, but we've always had, is how do you get to the fight? Uh, and most of the stuff goes by sea, unless it's already there. 
I can't understand why we have not put heavy sets all over Europe again, uh, given that we've all decided this is a real problem. Um, so I mean, there's there's solutions other than rapid expeditionary operations. It's you know getting troops to equipment that's already there. On the argument about, uh, yeah, I, I agree. We need different kinds of forces. Um, I think though what we've lost and how we've realigned our bases is they are not only different kinds, but they never see the other different forces. So I was at Bragg you know, talking the 82nd. And, you know, I showed the chart about you know you've got to operate with armor. And I look at it and I said, how many of you guys have ever even seen a tank? You know, much less operate one. How many guys at Drum have ever been in the field with an armored vehicle? How many guys, you know, at Lewis? So this is an issue of, you know, as the guys who control training in the Army. You know, how do you get the next exercise for the 82nd to be jumping into Stuart and linking up with an armored formation and doing an exercise? Uh, instead of going the NTC, NTC pure. So, I mean, we're gonna mix and match these capabilities. Um, I think that we are gonna field, you know, I mean, the other argument I always get is that there's, you know, not, we talked about this before lunch, there's two anecdotes here that I wanna talk, because I did this in the UK. I was at a armored vehicle conference uh, with, in, the, in London and the British at the time were going to get rid of all their challengers. They're going to warehouse them. And this member of parliament stood up and said, you know, because I gave a briefing about how we've used armor in every war we've been in and how it's very effective. And it doesn't have to be divisions. It can be 14 tanks like with the Marines. And I said, well, you know, that's all very well and fine. But, you know, we bought all these new MRAPs and we're going to build our formations around them. And the tanks are too expensive and they're old. And, you know, he said, defense critic in parliament. And I said, yeah, that's, that's an option. You know, that's a political choice. And I said, how is that a political choice? Well, because when the British army is fighting someone like Hezbollah and you mark their progress by burning MRAPs, you know, that's an operational problem for the commander. It's gonna be a political problem for you because you're gonna be the guy that, whose name's on the bill to get rid of challengers. Because the A doesn't stand for anti-tank guided missile. Uh, I gave a talk to the, about a month later, they asked me to come talk at the commander's conference at the Armour Center. And talking about Israel and Lebanon guys and need for combined arms maneuver. And this brigadier goes, you don't understand. He said, well, enlighten me. I said, we can't afford combined arms. There is no money. I said, well, you know, what, same problem we have. There's plenty of money. You just aren't getting any because you don't have an argument that creates political risk for decision makers who are allocating resources. This is the problem the Army has not communicated yet, is what are your consequences if I can't do this? You know, what are your consequences if we put someone in to name the place and they happen to be in the, the big X for the Grodval? You know, this is, you know, the concepts have to portray the risk and provide a mitigating strategy that's not operational. It has to be political or you will not get any money. Um, I think also that you know, we really, we talk about experimentation. The NIE is an experience, experiment about networks. It's not an experiment about operational concepts. Um, one of the things we recommend the first SSG is that you create a brigade in one of the formations in the Army one in the 80 seconds so you can actually practice forcible entry with new technologies and one in heavy units and one in light units to get people playing with new concepts, not new things or new networks, but new ideas to see if they're valid or not. Um, anyway, again, I'm sorry, long answer, but it's a difficult question. Well, actually, if I can then follow up uh, dealing yeah. with the political issues uh, associated with this. You know, the, uh, and, and you kind of address it slightly, and that is, you know, the, uh, the Soviets and, and, and other, many of our other adversaries are, are dealing with area weapons, uh, and, and we're dealing with precision, uh, precision weapons, you know, one shot, one kill. Uh, and is there, and thus it is affecting, I think, our doctrine right. associated with that. I think there's significant risk associated with that. Oh, I absolutely agree. Uh, because I, I think that especially if we don't have the lethality and survivability, we have to then uh, offset that 
but they change in our rules of use of force and uh, rules of engagement. Uh, because otherwise, if we don't create that barrier uh, ourselves, uh, then we yeah. I think we're inviting additional casualties on our side. So I've had this talk with the Air Force a lot because, you know, they don't remember their history either. So, you know, small diameter to bomb. Great for a small diameter target. You know, if you want to be precise and not cause collateral damage and you know, not affect things you don't want to affect, that's an appropriate choice in the kinds of wars we've been fighting. Sometimes collateral damage is gravy. Okay, um, I mean when the and you know the first part of OIF when the Iraqi formation tried to move, I mean you know picked them up with J stars, they're dropping 2,000 pound bombs with J down. And you can synchronize them because you've got things, you know, you can put them in a pattern where you just cover everything. And you don't, you know, it turns out with a 2,000 pound bomb, you don't have to hit the tank. You hit like close and nobody in the tank's interested in the war anymore. So, you know, this, you know, recovering the ability to understand the problem. The problem against, you know, massed formations is an area problem. And we're getting rid of DPICM on you know our conventional systems and because of a treaty that we've decided we're going to be good guys well, okay get rid of it but develop an icm warhead that has a dead rate that's acceptable to the treaty which we're not doing because these are problems you know, i mean a a smirch 300 millimeter rocket battalion takes out grid squares not one, multiple grid squares in 30 seconds. I mean, this is like a real problem. And it's something, you know, I don't know how we would react operationally or tactically to that kind of what happened to the Ukrainian regiment here. But man, I can only imagine how we'd act politically to it. So how are we gonna think about you know, dealing with these kinds of adversaries? Um, and, you know, I, I'm not stroking you guys, but you know this is the place it's got to happen. It is the only place in the Army it can happen. It doesn't happen in the COCOMs. It doesn't happen in the ASCCs because they're involved in this problem. It doesn't happen on the Army staff because they're you know, involved in something that's even closer usually. So you know, I think we need to get after it, quite frankly. We need the same kind of response we had here in 1973 to recognize that this is a no kidding problem that we need to get after and the processes we have shouldn't be a barrier, they should be something we negotiate, but we gotta get after it. I was you know, talking to somebody earlier today and said, you know, that every meeting I go to, I mean, really good, smart people, everybody doing the right thing, doing it, working as hard as they can. And you go to the, you know, war games or seminars or conferences and for the first couple of days, man, everybody's innovative and radical and, you know, change everything. And the next week, we talk ourselves out of it. Because, well, you know, we don't have the authorities. The budget's not aligned to do it. We can't spend money out of that pot. And, okay, you can't now. So the best improvement to the dot mill PF process was adding the other P. What has to change with policy to enable you to do the things, things you need to? And you're the guys that change policy, quite frankly. You create demands for new capabilities and new authorities. And congressmen, you know, I have a fair amount of correspondence with different people on the Hill. And they're just waiting for you to come and ask for something that they can support. Tim Bonds was down here talking this week or today about some work Rand's done about you know, rolling up what is expected of the Army that nobody realizes that the Army might not be able to do at 450. You know, how do you make the argument analytically to tell the people on the Hill who control, who have the money that you need some? And that going to 450 is not just a bad gut check feeling. You know, I feel, my gut tells me that's too small. Okay, well, that's, that, that ain't gonna happen. Any more? Yeah. I'm a teacher, so I can be loud without this if you need. 
Um, since you've invited this sort of brainstorming mentality, and since you are discussing the political side, I'd like to actually ask your shortlist on the practical side. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you showed a series of adaptations which could not be airdropped and therefore were slightly counterintuitive in certain operational environments. Well, to respond to those three types of energy, uh, sorry, um, enemy environments that you portrayed, what would you say is on a short list for our adaptations or financial prioritization of things that, hey, we're going to need this now or shortly, and I can put it on a C-130? Actor protection. Um, on the Army test, everybody says, you know, actor protection creates collateral damage and all this. The Army test was on an armored Humvee and did nothing to damage the Humvee significantly. So we can do that. You know, there, this system is ready now. You could buy it tomorrow morning, unless you went through the acquisition process and you buy it tomorrow morning in 100 years. Um, so a no kidding counter rocket, counter battery uh, detection and fire system that is adequate to range, you know, rocket systems that have 200 kilometer ranges. Um, and the other one, you know, is realizing that, you know, we need different systems than the ones we have, not keep improving them. Because there are technologies out there, I mean, the, so the mobile protected firepower thing. You know, we send the pointy end of the spear in, and whether we think we're ever going to do it or not, you ought to be thinking you are. So there are technologies out there that, that are airdroppable with active protection on them. And everybody said, well, they won't survive IEDs. Well, folks, there won't be any IEDs the first day. If you stay for 20 years, there will be. Okay, so what do I get in quick? And it doesn't have to stay there forever. It's like the 82nd and the 101st in World War II. You know, they were shock troops that went in early and they got pulled off the line until we ran out of infantry during the Battle of the Bulge. So it's a capability that you know, everybody in the Army doesn't need, but it really is an important capability. Somebody in the Army has it. So those are the big three I would give you right now. When we finally broke into Germany in World War II, we were confronted with a number of urban situations to solve. And one of the quick solutions they made then was to take a field artillery gun right. and move it up as close as they could to the target there and let it fire on the target. Of course, they had to get the security to get it there. And as far as tanks in the road, that took a hell of a lot of infantry to clear the top of their stories so they didn't get shot down from above. The only thing else I would say is listen to Snuffy Smith Rifleman when he'll right. pick up a solution to a problem in a hurry. They could literally smell the fact that the NBA had moved into an area long before the intelligence told us they were there. Right. So the, this has been the discussion for years about what we want as a flexible adaptive force. Um, and we kind of like, I mean, the story of the first year of OAF is that we don't know what we're doing, so I hope the captains can figure it out and the soldiers. So my view about all this is, you know, we know the problems, we can understand them, and I want to adapt as little as possible, because the cost of adaptation in, under fire is, you know, is extremely expensive in blood and treasure. I want to make the other guy adapt, you know? I want to be the guy that's making this guy be really in a position of no advantage. I want to be you know, fighting guys like Jam who are doing human wave attacks against my wall and have Bradleys and M1s that are cutting them down. So adaptation is something I'd like to see happen before the fight, not during the fight. There will be minimal adaptation if you've gotten it pretty right. But you know, make the other guy adapt. And we know who these folks are. So you know, it's the last thing I'll say is, you are the folks that are going to come up with these concepts. And, you know, these are understandable problems. If you, instead of aggregating, you know, a complex world, 
Well, yeah, it is. I mean, if you look from the moon, the Earth looks really complex with the sea and the land masses and all this other stuff, and there's millions of people running around. If you disaggregate it into Hezbollah, ISIS, Russian separatists, Chinese, they are complex in and of themselves, but they are understandable. And you can develop concepts and solutions and capabilities to deal with them once you start thinking about the adversary and not yourself. So, I think of any more questions? Sir, I'm uh, Pete Kippy from Capability Development uh, Directorate. Uh, one of the things you talked about is uh, get to know our enemies, uh, anticipate things. Uh, as our attention and strategies uh, shift into the Pacific region uh, where our adversaries are concentrating on area, de uh, area defense, area, uh, anti-axis area denial, and those capabilities start extending beyond the first, second, and even the third island chains. How does the Army meet those challenges? And basically, I'm asking, how does the Army stay relevant in those areas? Because as you well know, uh, those strategies and where we pay attention to drives the POM process, and certainly uh, the uh, Navy and the Air Force uh, focus is heavily in, on those areas to the detriment of uh, our Army uh, funding. Um, so, yeah, this is the perennial discussion, is everybody's stealing our money because we changed our idea about what the problem is. I had, you know, OSD policy guys, are investing in different, how many, what percentage of our forces are in the Pacific? Rough guess? Not 90%, around 60%? Because like there's other places in the world that are important. If you go down the list of missions that's in the Chairman's Risk Assessment, there's plenty of work for everybody to do. And you know, the people in OSD policy and on the Hill realize that you know, China's a future possibly peer competitor. And it's not necessarily we're gonna fight the Chinese. If we don't figure out the solution to the technical challenges they you know, present with A2AD, you know, they're gonna manifest themselves other, work, other places, like the Straits of Hormuz. You know, the Israelis lost the Corvette to a you know, shore-to-ship missile. There's an Iranian copy of a Chinese silkworm. So I think there's, if you go down the mission, there's plenty of work for everybody to do. Uh, you know, nobody in, in I know thinks that the only problem in the world is China. They know that China is probably going to present one of the most difficult technical questions until the Russians popped up. Now they say, well, you know, the Russians and the Chinese are really, okay, well, I got that. So who are they using to fight for them? The Chinese aren't fighting anybody, quite frankly. Uh, the Russians are using proxies in the Ukraine, supporting Syria, selling weapons to just about everybody we don't like. So I don't, I'm not worried about the fact that we're not relevant in the Pacific. I'm worried about we're not stressing our relevance everywhere else in the world. And we are relevant in the Pacific. You know, I mean, if you listen to the Chief's pitch about you know, every country in those places is brown-centric, there's a huge mission for the Army in that and missile defense and all the other things. But there's a, you know, that's a problem that is in many ways theoretical. There are lots of practical problems out there that nobody else can solve. I believe we're eventually going to wake up to the fact, I'm working on an article now about, so we're going to embed advisors. Uh, Michelle Flournoy and, and CNAS had a paper out the other day about how to get better about ISIS. Put advisors in the last covered position, the last concealed position, not even covered, so you, you can still get shot, and advise. And the last time we did this, I was trying to think, how do you make people understand that putting a group of five Americans out with a, a indigenous formation who the only reason you're there is because they don't have their act together. You know, put them out there. The last time this happened is the Easter Offensive in Vietnam, 1972 at Loch Ninh, where a five-man advisory team, uh, you know, Major Mark Smith, captain at the time, you know, 
they had a tough fight, use AC-130s, you know, everything you can imagine from the air. It still got overrun. And the commander, the Vietnamese commander, like surrendered. And they, you know, all been, you know, three of them were dead. One was wounded really badly. And they all, you know, two survivors got taken prisoner for a year. Down the street at another base, you know, a captain that was there, Ian e Ede, for about five days, he got captured. And both wanted to sting with Service Cross, did amazing things for days, and no one could come reinforce them because there were no American ground forces there at the time. And, you know, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese Army you know, didn't particularly have tender mercies towards them, but they were, they survived. I don't, I can't imagine what will happen to American advisors when, you know, Iraqi formations decide it's time to run again. Uh, I don't want to, you know, and we're gradually walking up to the place where, you know, what is it going to take to solve the problem of ISIS? It is a, you know, I use, the analogy I use, I had to write a response to my article, Dakota Wood wrote a, it'll be out next month, about, you know, he said, I agree with all this, but what then? And I said, you know, the what then is that, you know, ISIS is not the war we fought for the last, since 2003 in Iraq. It is a protostate. If you take the state away, where do you go to be an ISIS fighter when you get off the airplane? And there's no, like, caliphate waiting for you. The analogy I made is that, you know, if we don't start thinking about this as a cancer that's spreading not just through the Middle East but other places, you'll be like Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs, smartest guy in America, right? Apple, rich, develops a treatable form of pancreatic cancer and goes to his doctor. The doctor says, well, we need to do surgery and start chemotherapy. He says, well, I don't want to do that. That'll hurt, you know. So I'm going to go do this myself. Homeopathic remedies on the Internet, you know, all these bizarre treatments. About nine months later, I said, well, I still feel bad. He goes to the doctor and says, well, yeah, okay, let's do that, what you said before. I said, well, okay, let's tell We can't now. It's in your liver. And your pancreas is on fire. So what does that mean? It means you're going to die. You know, if you come nine months earlier, we could have saved you. You know, this is the problem with the view we have about the employment of ground forces. It is tough surgery and the doctor's in jeopardy, but it's the only way you can solve the problem. And that's the piece of you know, advocacy that I'm not hearing loudly enough. Uh, and people on the Hill are asking for it, believe me. So what is, you know, what is your concept to defeat ISIS? Could that possibly be a challenge we face in the future? I think so. I'll stay here all night, but I'm sure some guys are tired, so. <laughs> okay, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan Fu, uh, Singapore liaison. I have two parts of the questions. Okay, first uh, is actually on urban, urban ops. Second part is more on capability development. So back to urban ops, uh, you mentioned a little bit, I mean quite, the emphasis seems to point towards the urban, urbanized terrains or this. So one of my, the comments that I have, and I would like to hear your views is, I mean, defining uh, mega cities based on population size is, is one way of looking at it. But I think more importantly, when we look at uh, mega cities, because coming from Singapore, a little red dot. I think it's about the density of the place rather than the sheer size of the population. For example, in Singapore, the size of Singapore is only slightly smaller than Fort Benning, but we have 5.5 million. Right. And we are going to go to 7 million in uh, 10 years' time. So um, one of the views that we always look at our urban terrains as in there's a lot of challenges for the people that are going in to trying to to operation, but perhaps the way we look at it, we, we perhaps can have another uh, perspective to it. What are the challenges for the defenders or the people that is operating within the urban cities? And 
thereby look at it and to exploit it accordingly so that we can actually gain a better advantage. So that's uh, one part. So back to uh, capability development. Um, we always think about, I like your analogy about polishing the nibons or this. Because end of the day, I mean, first, um, when we come to capability development, my views is uh, there's always three factors to it. One is in terms of your force structuring, the amount of human resource or this that you need to pump in. Second is actually in terms of the system cost, whether is it um, acquisition cost as well as the operating cost. Then the third aspect of it is like what you say, the Steve Jobs example, is the developmental time. So um, if we are just looking at a situation and trying to say that uh, we continue to polish the diamond and things like that, sooner or later the organization may become irrelevant. So my view is how can we come out with solution or to have a better threat assessment so that when, when we come, come from a force structuring perspective, we can have a uh, we can have a, don't need to engage too many forces into it, okay? Second, we don't need to uh, spend exorbitant costs. In, in fact, that is not realistic in the current climax. And the other part is, how can we actually make the capability development in terms of developmental time to be able to rapidly configure something to be able to address whatever needs that we have? Because really, the presentation that you, you focus on hybrid trees is one, uh, hybrid tracks is one of the focus. But actually moving ahead, the, the higher part of the thread can be a challenge because the environment is rapidly changing. It's not just about the middle ground. Yep. yep, thanks. So the one thing we came to grips with in the SSGs, you know, what is a mega city? And there's no such thing as a mega city. There's London, there's Tokyo, there's Singapore, and they're all radically different. So I agree with you. I mean, it's, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how do you study the places you think you might have to fight. So I'm, I'm not particularly in, interested in understanding, you know, lots, you know, New York City or Singapore. I'm interested in the places we know where there's problems that they're large urban areas, but I can study those large urban areas very specifically. Um, but the challenge to me with urban operations, again, is that how do I shrink the problem to where the adversary is, not have the city be the problem? But back to affordability, you know, I mean, we've had this argument, you know, every time, you know, we were talking earlier, I've seen the downsizing, well, I've actually lived in the downsizing movie three times. You know, I know who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, I know how it ends every time. You know, the army will get smaller, and the army will fight for end strength instead of capability. Um, every time the army is downside, General MacArthur in 1935 submitted a budget that the R&D budget was less than a million dollars. The biggest you know, modernization program was putting rubber tires on the 75 millimeter howitzers that hadn't been modernized. And because he wanted to keep end strength. And he kept 5,000 extra people and had an army of, you know, like less than 200,000. So that army, you know, there was no money. There's no money at all until like 1939 because a problem started to appear called Nazi Germany and the Japanese. So the army went from 228,000 soldiers and about 14,000 officers to an army of 8 million people between 1941 and 1945. 25% you know, of the GDP of this country was spent on the military and prosecuting those wars because it was a problem we had to solve. So you know, when anybody tells me there's no money, there's no resources, we'll never get this, we'll never, well, you know, that, tell George Marshall that. You know, and also tell, you know, the folks in Korea where the army doubled overnight during the Korean War. So this is a question of, what does it take politically for the country to understand what it takes to solve the problem and is the investment worth it? And you can't make that argument unless you say, why am I spending the money on this instead of something else? And my personal view is that I'm not just worried about 450,000. I think it's too small. I'm worried as we get 
is we concentrate on maintaining end strength, the opportunity costs and being a capable army of 450,000 is at risk. So how do you start thinking about whatever the size of the army is, how can I make it capable? You have to argue for the end strength as well because I don't think we have enough to cover down on the problems. But that is not the only metric you have to be concerned about. Whatever's left has to be able to go do what the nation wants it to do. And again, so I, I think that was the last question. Thanks a lot for your attention and time. And